Few cars have a worse reputation in the Western world than the Yugo, and that's not particularly surprising. It was slow, it was cheap, it wasn't particularly well built, and it was communist. As such, every worst cars of all time list has to include the Yugo. Or does it? You see, the story or quality of this little car can't be summed up in one of those hastily constructed lists. It's a story of unity and division, a story of triumph and struggle, a story of national pride and international condemnation, a story of unlikely twists and predictable turns. This is the story of the Zastava Corral, also known as the Yugo. Before we talk about the Yugo, we have to talk about the country for which it was named, Yugoslavia. While the first iteration of the country, the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, existed from 1924 until the Second World War, our story is more focused on the country's second iteration, the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. It was established after Josip Broz Tito and a group of communist and some non-communist forces called the Partisans liberated the country from Nazi rule in 1945. The country included six somewhat independent republics, Croatia, Serbia, Montenegro, Slovenia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Macedonia. Most of the power was initially highly centralized in the federal government, which was controlled by now President Tito and the Communist Party of Yugoslavia. However, a series of constitution changes in 1953, 1963, and 1974 did give the republics and local governments more authority. A dispute with the Soviet Union over their growing influence led the country to stop being allied with the USSR in 1948. In fact, Yugoslavia was one of the founders of the Non-Aligned Movement, which was dedicated to resisting being controlled by a certain power bloc. As such, Yugoslavia received some Western aid and trade, and adopted a more market-reliant economy than the USSR. Additionally, the country experienced quite a bit of economic growth, especially between 1953 and 1965, following a push to industrialize. President Tito, while re-elected several times after 1953, was given an unlimited term in 1963. As implied by his ownership of a Mercedes-Benz 600 grocer, Tito was a dictator who suppressed and executed political opponents. However, he implemented many popular policies in Yugoslavia, with his ideology of brotherhood and unity managing to keep the six different republics together until his death in 1980. While there is, obviously, so much more to talk about with the country itself, the story of the Yugo automobile starts with an industrial firm called, and I apologize for my pronunciation, Zavodi Servena Zastava, located in the Serbian city of Kragujevac, their name roughly translates to Red Flag Plant. They started out as a weapons manufacturer as early as the 1800s. However, in the late 1930s, they began producing Ford trucks under license for the Yugoslav army. During World War II, the factory focused on weapons production, but did briefly make American Jeeps under license in the early 1950s. However, in 1954, Zastava began producing passenger cars. Initially, they produced a small number of Fiat 1400 and 1900 models under license. More significantly though, in 1955, Zastava began to produce the smaller, more affordable Zastava 600, which was based on the Fiat 600. Nicknamed the Fika, this was essentially Yugoslavia's first people's car, and it was popular enough to keep it in production, with engine size increases and minor updates, until 1985. Over the Fika's impressive 30-year production run, Zastava produced nearly a million of them. It was simple, it was relatively affordable, it was cute, and it was loved throughout Yugoslavia. In 
1971, Zostava began producing slightly modified versions of the recently introduced Fiat 128. Known as the Zostava 128, 101, 1100, 1300, GTL, or Scala, depending on the version and when it was produced, it was nicknamed Stojanin, which is a male name in its homeland. This vehicle was quite advanced near the beginning of its production cycle, with front-wheel drive, transverse engine, fully independent suspension, and unibody construction. Additionally, Zostava's hatchback version of the 128, the 101, came out three years before Fiat's own hatchback version. This added an extra layer of practicality for Yugoslavian families. While the 55 horsepower four-cylinder engine in most versions wasn't exactly powerful, it was sufficient for a small, lightweight family car. At least it was faster than a Turbant. In 1978, Zastava presented a new hand-built prototype vehicle to President Tito, a car which would become the Yugo we know today. While it was based on a shortened Fiat 128 platform, it was heavily modified by Zastava. It was to have a low purchase price so that every Yugoslavian family could own one, and as a symbol of unity, all six Yugoslav republics were to contribute to the car's production. Though it was assembled in Serbia with other Zastava models, it had electrical components from Slovenia, engine parts from Bosnia, mirrors and trim from Macedonia, and Croatian interior components and brakes. The majority of the other parts were produced in Serbia and Montenegro. As such, this humble three-door hatchback was to be the culmination of Tito's ideals of brotherhood and unity. However, Tito never lived to see his people's car produced. He died on May 4, 1980, just a few months before the first Yugo left the production line. As such, this humble little car was born into a country in crisis. In the years leading up to Tito's death, Yugoslavia's economy had begun to stagnate, and afterwards it plummeted into a deep recession. As inflation and unemployment began to take root, a significant portion of Yugoslavia's industrial economy rested on the shoulders of the humble Yugo. Despite Yugoslavia's crumbling economy, the Yugo, branded the Zastava 45, 55, and 65 in the early 1980s, was relatively successful in its home market. After all, it was essentially a smaller, more modern version of the Stojadin that was already immensely popular. However, Yugoslavian success alone wasn't going to do much to help the country's problems. Zastava needed to start building Yugos for export markets. And export them they did. Throughout its lifespan, the Yugo was exported to over 70 different countries, which included the UK, Egypt, India, Sudan, Colombia, and many more. However, this video will focus mostly on just one of those countries, the United States of America. You see, this is where a man named Malcolm Bricklin comes into the story. A businessman who was known for gathering a massive amount of funding for incredibly risky business ventures. Bricklin is quite a notable, if problematic, figure in the automotive world. Perhaps his most lasting achievement in the space was the foundation of Subaru of America, before he was kicked out by the board of directors, that is. However, he also managed to churn out around 1,800 Canadian-built Bricklin SV1s, which is surprising given that the safety vehicle 1's heavy, problematic gullwing doors and questionable fiberglass and acrylic bodywork weren't exactly conducive to safety. He also imported Fiat 124 Spiders and X19s to the US after Fiat left the market, but their high prices kept many buyers away. Following the Fiat importing business, Bricklin attempted to replicate the formula he used with Subaru. Find a cheap car from another country, with incredibly cheap labor, of course, get the rights to import them to America, and sell it as the least expensive car in the country. And in that regard, the Zostava 55 seemed to fit the bill perfectly. However, actually getting it to America wasn't so simple. After inspecting the car, the newly formed Yugo America wanted to make a few changes. Well, more than a few actually. All of the changes, additions, and modifications for American Yugo models were specified in an exceptionally long fax message 
which was nicknamed the 4 Meter Fax by managers at Zostavo. Yugo America also wasn't pleased with the copious amounts of brandy drunk by Zostava employees during breaks, and asked for a separate Yugo A production line specifically for US models. And eventually, after a multitude of changes, the Yugo was approved for sale in the United States. Introducing the new Yugo, a paramount engineering achievement from Yugoslavia. From busy traffic to rough terrain, Yugo will lead you anywhere. From the west to east coast, Yugo defeats the competitors. Reliability is his second name. Yugo America put everything they had into the car's launch in summer 1985. From a multi-million dollar ad campaign during primetime television to an extensive network of around 250 dealerships, Bricklin and his associates seemed to actually put some thought into the vehicle's introduction, which, again, is surprising considering his previous ventures. Some described what followed as Yugo Mania, with a base MSRP of 3,990 US dollars. The Yugo GV made even the Hyundai Excel seem expensive by comparison. Thousands of people headed to their nearest dealer and placed a deposit without even taking a test drive. At times, demand for the vehicle outstripped supply fivefold. In America, the Yugo was available in several different trim levels. While other markets offered a base 903 cubic centimeter engine, in America the base GV, meaning great value model, came with a carbureted 1.1 liter four cylinder engine. It put out 55 horsepower, which isn't too bad considering that it only weighed around 1800 pounds, or 825 kilograms, and was paired to a four speed manual transmission. Standard equipment included full carpeting, a rear windshield wiper and defroster, reclining front seats, opening rear quarter windows, a folding rear seat, a low fuel light, a full size spare tire, a locking gas cap, and, crucially, a cigarette lighter. There were also some optional features, such as a radio, floor mats, hubcaps, a roof rack, and even air conditioning which I certainly wouldn't want to use when trying to accelerate. There was also the GV+, Plus, GVL, and GVS trim levels. The GVL and GVS had minor interior and trim upgrades. The cream of the crop, however, was the Yugo GVX. Unlike the rest of the lineup, the GVX had a fuel-injected 64 horsepower 1.3 liter inline four and a five-speed manual transmission. It also had fog lights, alloy wheels, and perhaps most importantly, a wonderfully 1980s body kit. While the demand for such an affordable vehicle was immense, the motoring press wasn't particularly impressed with the Yugo. Car and Driver, for example, said that, quote, the average reader will regard the Yugo not as a real car, but, at best, as a car-like curiosity. The shifter was about as vague as a legal document. There were electrical problems, some engines failed prematurely, and the dealers loved to price gouge. One owner reported being charged $75 for an owner's manual. Additionally, the fuel economy of around 25 miles per gallon wasn't particularly impressive for such a small car. However, the price was right, and most other 1980s economy cars weren't exactly the last word in quality. The Yugo also had an important impact on foreign policy. As Yugoslavia wasn't aligned with the USSR, America was looking to increase its trade and influence in the country as the Cold War continued on. The Yugo was a symbol of trade between the two countries, and one was even owned by the US ambassador to Yugoslavia. During the first few years of sale in America, the Yugo sold... okay. In 1987, for example, Yugo America sold 48,812 units. Most owners, at least at first, seemed to appreciate the car for what it was. An owner from a period report in Popular Mechanics said that, You have to keep the car in perspective. I expected a basic $3,990 car when I bought the Yugo. If you keep that in mind, it's a nice little car has everything I need to get me from A to B. And while the same report 
stated that only 42.4% of the 1,000 respondents would buy a Yugo again, the number was likely a symptom of people looking to upgrade to more expensive cars for their next purchase. Among the wealth, excess, glitz and glamour of 1980s America, the Yugo stood out to those looking for a simple car, but it also stood out to everyone else. You see, the Yugo had an outsized impact on American popular culture for its sales numbers. It found its way into late night comedy routines and was a punchline for journalists across the country. Soon it was on every worst cars of all time list and became a metaphor for anything that sucked. Let's jump the bridge. But we're in a Yugo. You go. What are you gonna do? It didn't matter how bad the car actually was, because it was a small, basic, and cheap car that was made in a communist country. And unfortunately for the poor little Yugo, its troubles didn't end there. Like pretty much every company started by Malcolm Bricklin, Yugo America went bankrupt at the beginning of 1989. Sales, while respectable, peaked in 1987 and weren't high enough to justify the low profit margins involved with selling the cheapest car in America. No 1989 Yugos were imported, and dealers had to make do with leftover 1988 cars. Yugo America was revived as a subsidiary of, of Zostava after its reorganization, but the car's slow sales and terrible public image weren't exactly promising. Zostava did try to drum up enthusiasm with the fuel-injected GV+, and the new Yugo Cabrio model from 1990. The Cabrio was based on the top-of-the-line Yugo GVX, and had a price tag twice that of the base GV. Even with all the features of the GVX, plus a power-operated convertible roof, the Cabrio couldn't save the Yugo's free-falling sales. Further improvements were made from 1991, including larger gas tanks, updates to the seats, and the option of a Renault-sourced 3-speed automatic transmission in models equipped with a 1.3-liter engine, which does not sound like it would be very good. Back in Yugoslavia, Tito's ideology of brotherhood and unity had all but evaporated. Tensions between ethnic groups, which had been flaring throughout the 1980s, resulted in the horrific Balkan Wars of the 1990s, and the complete collapse of Yugoslavia. Amongst all the violence, war crimes, and genocide, Yugo production was not exactly a priority. NATO sanctioned all former Yugoslavian member states in 1992, halting exports of the car. The American dealer network vanished, and spare parts became nearly impossible to find. And if that wasn't enough, the Yugo's engines were of an interference design required timing belt changes every 40,000 miles. As a result, American Yugos were neglected and essentially thrown away when it didn't make sense to keep them running anymore. In the US, where parts didn't exist, Yugos were seen as disposable and unreliable. However, parts were still available in the former Yugoslavian states, and surprisingly, production of the car continued. In 1999, during the Kosovo conflict, the Zostava factory was bombed by NATO due to continued arms production. But even that didn't kill the Yugo. The factory was rebuilt, and the Yugo, now known as the Zostava Corral in its home market, restarted production. Significant updates were also made to the vehicle around this time, with the launch of the Zostava Corral IN. According to the ultra-reliable source of Wikipedia, the updated model featured central locking, power windows, a headlight leveling switch, power mirrors, optional air conditioning, and the same available 3-speed automatic as late US Yugos. In addition to the Fiat 1.1 and 1.3 liter engines, you could also option the Corral IN with a 1.1 liter Peugeot sourced engine with 60 horsepower. That particular version managed to pass European Union safety standards, but never ended up being sold there. It's also worth mentioning the Zostava Florida, a five-door hatchback 
introduced in 1988. It was more modern than other Zastavas, with an aerodynamic shape designed by Giorgetta Giugiaro and a group of Zastava engineers. The Florida, also known as the Sauna in Miami, was mainly sold in Eastern Europe, but was more expensive and less popular than Zastava's other models. By the mid-2000s, Zastava had fallen into dire financial straits. Fiat, which had been slowly increasing its influence on the company for years, took over the factory entirely in 2008. The last Corral IN in Florida rolled off the assembly line on November 11th of that same year. Production of the Zastava Scala, which was even older and less expensive than the Corral, ended not long afterwards. After 30 years and nearly 800,000 cars produced, the Yugo's run was over. In America, the Yugo was doomed to fail. It was too slow, too simple, too inexpensive, and too communist for the Reagan era 1980s. It didn't matter that the cars themselves weren't actually as terrible as most people think because every card was lined up against the Yugo's success. It was marketed by a man whose life was defined by failure, came from an incredibly unstable country, was cheaply made, and had an unfortunate reputation for unreliability. It was viewed as more of a punchline than a car. And as the supply of parts from war-torn Yugoslavia dried up, Yugos have all but disappeared from the roads of most export markets. But even as the ideals of brotherhood and unity that created it turned to hatred, the Yugo soldiered on in its home market. It survived violence, sanctions, bombings, and the collapse of the nation that created it. Eventually, though, Fiat, the company that had been integral to Zastava's continued existence, orchestrated its demise. But even today, Zastava's cars continue to be reliable companions for those living in the countries that were once known as Yugoslavia. Thank you all so much for watching this video, and I hope you found it interesting. This is quite a complex story, so I apologize for any information that I missed. Before you all go, though, there are just a few more things about the story that I wanted to mention. The first is that Malcolm Bricklin also tried to import Malaysian Proton Sagas to the United States, but it never actually happened. Additionally, the last car to use the Zastava badge was actually just a rebadged Fiat Punto, with the Zastava name dropped when Fiat took over the factory. I also want to make it clear that I'm not saying that the Yugo was necessarily a good car. I know there will be plenty of comments from people who owned Yugos telling everyone that they fell apart if you looked at them wrong. However, the fact remains that Yugos were perfectly acceptable transportation devices for many owners, especially if they lived in the countries that actually had part support. And even if you don't live in one of those countries, the Yugos that have survived have become cult classics that offer an affordable and unique entry into classic car ownership. With all that being said, if you enjoyed the video, consider liking it or subscribing, and I hope you have a wonderful day! Feel free to also check out my second channel for random gaming videos, maybe? I don't know. It's it's gonna be a thing. I'm not really sure what's gonna be on there, but uh, it's it's there, so uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, bye. For real, this time.